Hi there, I'm John Zarella, president of Jay-Z Media and former CNN correspondent. I will be your guest host today. Today, we are going to turn the tables, and I am going to interview the host of the Strong Homes Safe Families podcast, Leslie Chapman Henderson, president and CEO of Flash, the nonprofit Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. Welcome, Leslie, to your podcast. Thank you so very much, and thank you for hosting me today so that we could talk about looking at the end of 2020 and not looking back so much on all of the challenges with the pandemic, a record-breaking hurricane season, more than 8 million acres burned from wildfire, but looking forward instead to 2021. There's positive news coming on the pandemic front due to vaccines. And I think we're all very hopeful that we'll be able to, you know, make 2020 the hindsight instead of vice versa. So what we really want to do today is talk about the things that people can do, the affordable, simple, do-it-yourself ways while we're still home more than (laughs) not for a while, because, you know, it's going to take a while, but we want to help people take advantage of that home time, just as we did this year, to make themselves even safer to keep the family safe, and to make their home stronger. So we're really excited to do that with you. And um, we've got a little top 10 figured out to do it. You know, and and uh, I was looking over some of that, and our listeners are going to want to hear about those because I sat there and when I was reading over some of them, I'm saying to myself, you know, gee whiz, that's so simple and easy. And, you know, it's one of those, duh, a no brainer. But before we dive into that list, let's talk about your background and the flash mission. Can you tell us about yourself, your educational background, anything you want to share about your professional journey? Sure, sure. So I've had, I think our organization and our role and our willingness to tackle such a big and diverse mission, which is strengthening homes and safeguarding families. I think a lot of it comes from my experience and I'm very fortunate. I've lived in a lot of different places, all of which have had different natural hazards that we face, but I grew up mostly in DC and my dad worked for NASA and then left and we moved on to Florida. But along the way, I learned a lot about hurricanes. We went through them growing up. So you really develop a passion for that kind of safety. And then when I got married, I ended up living on and near Injurlik Air Base in Turkey because my husband was in the Air Force, in the JAG Corps. So we, I was overseas teaching and I've always had kind of, I think, the heart of a teacher or maybe it's just, you know, wanting to tell stories and share But in Turkey, we faced earthquakes. And of course, we went from Turkey to California, where we faced earthquakes and wildfires. So I think I've just always lived in the the path of natural hazards. And because of that, and also from working in the insurance industry, which is how I met you during Hurricane Andrew, as you know, in 1992, I just think this has been a top of mind aspect of my life. So I wanted to know how to be safe in an earthquake, how to be safe in a hurricane. And then outgrowth of that is, okay, so if I can make myself safe, how can I make sure my house is still intact? So I have some place to come home to. So that I think that's how I came to have real passion for this, that and working in the insurance industry, specifically in catastrophe response and seeing firsthand that there's, you know, your life can change in the blink of an eye. So if your home is intact and strong, the hurricane goes through and passes, you get to go back home, get on with your life, get your kids back in school, go back to your job and resume an ordinary life. But as you know, and I know from being in so many places after so many disasters, if the house fails, your life is suspended and often for years and years to come. So that's kind of how my passion was created for this. And my passion with Flash, I was the first employee in 98 and just been honored to be a part of it ever since. You mentioned uh, it, your life can be changed in a heartbeat. And yeah, we uh, we first met during Hurricane Andrew. Can't believe 28 years ago. Just phenomenal. But the idea of what we saw there, what you saw, what I saw there, and how people were displaced from their homes. Many left South Florida, didn't come back. Many, you know, uh, lost their homes for 
over a year during the rebuilding process. So it is heart wrenching. It is tumultuous for the individuals that are involved in, in, in that. And uh, it's all the more reason that people need to know how to protect themselves and how to protect their families. Before we get into all that, tell us about Flash and its mission. So the Flash mission, which has never changed since our founding in 1998, and we were organized formally in 98, but we were really a committee of people coming out of the post-Hurricane Andrew era that had a so-called day job. You know, FEMA, the National Hurricane Center, Red Cross, uh, my company at the time, Allstate, State Farm, and others, we all had a primary role post-disaster to either respond in different ways And the idea of Flash was, wait a minute, is we help everyone recover, are they going to recover the same way? Are we going to make a change so that it doesn't break down the same way next time? Are we going to build back the same way or are we going to build back better and build back and break this cycle of destruction where we build a certain way, the homes are destroyed, the family's lives are interrupted, and then we build it back the same way and the cycle is perpetuated. So the flash mission is strengthening homes and thereby safeguarding families. Because back to what you just said about all of the things that happen after a disaster, the key here is they don't have to turn out that way. It is not a foregone conclusion that you have to lose your house. And that's probably the most important organizing principle of our organization, which is helping people understand it's not luck. When you see a home that survives in whatever disaster it is, you'll sometimes see a caption in the newspaper that says, lucky homeowner. No, what we want people to know is it's not luck. When a house survives a wildfire or an earthquake or a hurricane, it's because someone did something intentional beforehand. They built it right with those very specific things in mind that can make the difference. And so that's all we've focused on since that time is getting that point across. We use a lot of different methods for doing that. We we do continuing education courses for engineers and architects. We do consumer outreach with children. As you know, we were in Disney for eight years doing edutainment to help people get it. But the this point of it all is the same, even if the audience and the message channel is different each time. It's helping people, putting them in charge of their own disaster story so that they can look back without regret and they can make sure that they bounce back as fast as humanly possible. Well, and you know, you, you have come up with uh, the top 10 things that people can do for homes to enhance the safety and resilience should a disaster occur. So let's go now into that top 10 list of tips. And this is where I think the listeners are really going to be amazed at what they can do. And it's not going to cost them a whole lot. So where do consumers start? So, and we derive these, just so you know, we do a very robust business every year, business in quotes, because our information is free. It's sourced to the best minds in the science and research community, but we talk to people all year long. And so these are derived from talking to them. The number one tip is know your risk. We say this because too often consumers will tell us, oh, I don't have any risk where I live. (laughs) And the truth is everybody does. There's something that you need to be mindful of no matter where you live. Often, if nothing else, it's flooding. So we want people to start their journey into a safer 2021 by finding out what their risk is. And there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do this. You can even just Google a risk name or an, an event name and your town and see if there's a disaster history. We have a lot of different online tools for you to do this. You can email Flash. You can visit our website, flash.org. FEMA has a really nice risk identifier tool or two or three that's out there, but just start the journey by understanding what your community has experienced in the past because there's a very good chance that those are the very things that can happen. And just because your community hasn't experienced a disaster already, sure, as you said, it doesn't mean it it won't ever happen in the future. And the reality is that no matter where you live on this planet, you're facing some sort of a risk. So knowing what disasters you face is a great starting point. So now let's get to the individual perils. How about we start with earthquakes? What's the number one thing that people may not know about protecting their homes from an earthquake? Well, one of the things that people don't 
realize is that one of the most significant threats to safety and your home preservation in an earthquake is called the fire following. And those fires that start when the earthquake occurs, your home may survive the earthquake. And in a lot of the country, we have great building codes that keep that shaking from destroying your building, thereby you are safe inside. But you need to know how to turn off the gas supply to your home to ensure you don't have a gas leak because those gas leaks are, if not the number one, often at least the number one or two reasons that fires ignite. And it's very difficult to cope with those and stay safe once it happens. So the simplest thing to do is to secure a wrench for your gas shutoff valve. You have to find out where your gas shutoff valve is outside your home have the right kind of wrench to use in an emergency, and then just go ahead and call your utility provider that provides the gas and talk to them about it. Most of the time, they will have specific details on different things to keep in mind. And then one of the other things is to know how you're going to get the gas turned back on Mm -hmm. once the crisis passes. So this is a great one for earthquake because the cost, typical cost of that wrench is under $20. And just think about the cost of losing your home in a catastrophic fire versus $20. And by the way, this is a great gift idea for um, all kinds of occasions as well. So we want for earthquake, let's just start With the gas shutoff valve, getting a wrench, there's much more you can do on Earthquake, but that's where you'll, um, you can come to Flash.org. I can't wait for somebody to send me a wrench for Christmas. But of course, I don't have gas, so I'm okay on that. But, you know, I digress a little bit, Leslie. But, you know, if you recall, (laughs) we all recall, of course, even in hurricanes, what, what did Hurricane Sandy do in some of those neighborhoods? When all those, we saw all those gas fires that were blowing up all over. And if people had perhaps had the ability or forethought to shut the gas off, some of that wouldn't have happened uh, up there in uh, you know New York, New Jersey. That's right. And you helped us tell the story of a demonstration yes. home we built on Breezy Point, in particular in New York, which Breezy Point was stricken by gas and other fires yeah. after Sandy. And so it's not just an earthquake that can cause that fire following is a common thread after most disasters. So yes. this is a great thing to have, knowing how to, and, and even if it's not a catastrophic loss, you need to know how to turn the gas supply off to your house. Exactly. Regardless, because it could help you. And, and, and it's hard to find that wrench if you don't already have it. We, okay. Emergency. We all know. We all know that when it rains, it can certainly flood. In fact, in South Florida, just maybe a month or two ago, it had nothing to do with a, a tropical system, but they just had tremendous amount of rainfall and a lot of flooding down there. So what is it that you would like all homeowners to know about protecting their homes from a flood? So flooding, as you mentioned, is nearly a universal hazard. Wherever it rains, it can flood. So there's some really critical things to know about how to protect yourself financially from flood because these are the, you know, we put these in the regret column. We talk to a lot of people who wish they had known several things. Number one, flood insurance is the essential, not just the best financial protection, but the essential protection so that you can come back after a flood because flood is not included in your ordinary homeowner's insurance policy that you have and often cases is required by you know your mortgage lender so flood is excluded and it's covered under a separate policy which can be sold by your insurance company or agent but it's really underwritten in most cases there is some private out there, but in most cases, it's it's covered by the federal government. So you want to buy a separate policy for flood, and there's a 30-day waiting period to get that policy. So if, say, you're in a hurricane zone and the hurricane watches begin, it's too late to get flood insurance. In the instance where it's not hurricane-related, even then, it's too late to get the policy. But with the way that we're developing, and we love living near the water, we love living near the coastline, the more we fill in with buildings and what they call non-pervious surfaces that can't absorb the water, the more propensity there is, as in South Florida and other areas, for flooding. Don't even not to mention sea level rise and those types of things. Flooding is here to stay and it's on the, I won't say on the rise, I'll just say it's increasing. So you really need to protect yourself. Otherwise, it's very hard to come back. And the good news is that flood insurance is becoming more and more affordable and and you really can't afford not to have it. 
So if you look at a home where you have a you need coverage, say for example, two hundred fifty thousand dollar home, and you have a hundred thousand dollars in contents, the average premium in a non high hazard zone is five hundred and seventy two dollars. And if you divide that out by the monthly cost, and you think about the cost to replace your home from flooding, which flooding is a very expensive type of disaster because you have to muck out the water, dry everything out, rip out the drywall, pull all the electrical, et cetera, et cetera. You really need to think long and hard about getting flood insurance. As I mentioned before, the good news is a lot of the private sector is starting to sell flood insurance. It didn't used to be that way. So there's a kind of the advent of more competitive pricing for flood insurance. And what that means is it can get you can find an affordable way to get flood insurance because frankly, we just can't afford not to have it. And if you don't know about your flood risk, there's a variety of ways you can go about finding out. One is you can contact your insurance company or you can talk to your local building department about you know level of risk and the, maybe the flood history for where you live. There's a website, floodsmart.gov, where you can get some more details on flooding and again, thinking about just a nearly universal hazard. Yeah, I know. You don't have to really look any further one. than what Hurricane Harvey did in the Houston area a few years ago to get a pretty good handle on uh, on what happens with the uh, flooding. So, you know, 2020, talking about hurricanes, busiest season on record. Many people had hesitations about going to a shelter due to COVID. There were lots of stories about that. And even though they were encouraged to go, I mean, a lot of people had reservations and rightly so. If a homeowner wants to prepare to shelter in place during hurricane season, what do you think is the best do-it-yourself hurricane preparation activity that will give them the most bang for their buck? And right now is the time to do it if you're going to do it. That's right. Because it's not, well, it's hopefully not as hot and warm. So we had a, a lot of success with this topic this past year. And that's why I want to come back to it with the vengeance, because again, do it yourself, affordable, simple things you can do that make a world of difference. So the soffit, we've put the soffit on the map. People go, <laughs> what the heck is the soffit? We've talked about this with our partners at the Weather Channel, and we promoted it through our Hurricane Strong initiative. And we actually had 10,000 downloads in a one-week period of our soffit checklist. So if you don't know what a soffit is, we need to start with that. So if you're standing on your front porch or outside your home and you look up underneath your roof, you will see a horizontal surface where, think of it as kind of like a screen door for your attic, okay? If you look up underneath your roof edge, there's material there. It's usually got perforation or holes in mm -hmm. it because it's got to be vented, right? It's either going to be made out of some type of light gauge metal or mine is made out of wood with screens in it. And the soffit is what keeps the bugs and the, you know, yep. other uh, yep. the critters, rodents, et cetera, mm -hmm. out of your attic, hopefully. But here's what happens in a hurricane or high wind event. That wind-driven rain is going to come along and hit the side of your house. And then the, the wind is going to push that up and it's going to knock right into that soffit. If your soffit covers are tight and well installed and reinforced, it's going to hold that water out of your attic. If it's not, it's going to push the soffit cover in. The water is going to slide up your wall, your exterior wall, into your attic. And guess where it's going right. to go? Right down yep. through your ceiling into your house. Okay. So one of the things that happens is that. And that is a very frequent problem. I think it was Hurricane Charlie that we saw the, that happen the most. We had some, you know, every disaster has a has a building performance success or failure story or two or five or 10. And in Hurricane Andrew, we lost a lot of gable ends. So as you know, we just saw wholesale mm -hmm. Garage collapses doors of blown roofs, in. That was right? one of the big contributors. Yep. So we fixed that. I say we, lots of folks together, building code reforms, et cetera. And the roofs were largely intact in 2004 during Hurricane Charlie. So Hurricane Charlie came along, the roof stayed on, but we had not, we didn't know we had a problem with soffit covers. So we had lots of houses with a great roof intact, but inside they had ceilings full of water or ceilings that had already collapsed because they were full of water. And this is from this simple covering and its failure. So the greatest thing you can do 
for hurricane, the high impact, low cost activity, if you can safely scale a ladder, is to get up up there with some clear, inexpensive caulk. And we have diagrams and everything. And we'll put all that in with this uh, podcast and put some reinforcing dabs of caulk along the lines of the joints where the soffit cover is so that you can make sure it stays very strong. And when the wind and water hits it, it stays in place and keeps the water out of your attic. There's a fascinating statistic that our, some of our science partners from the insurance industry, the Institute for Business and Home Safety, did a study. And when you don't protect the roof and it's not, and, and the water gets in, okay, and this isn't just soffit, but just the roof in general when it's exposed and you lose your shingles, you can prevent 95% of the damage by protecting the roof and sealing it. But if you don't, you're going to get one inch of rain. Every inch of rain that comes in is going to produce nine bathtubs worth of water wow. going into your attic mm. and eventually through your ceiling. So there's a lot of work around this idea of soffit covers and roof ceiling and this whole idea, but you don't need anybody else's help if you can get on that ladder. <laughs> and again, another great case <laughs> idea, cough, you know, go with that uh, wrench. <laughs> um, I have a testimonial here because after Irma blew through here in Florida, on the back side <laughs> of my house, I lost about 10 foot of soffit blown around to the other side of the house. I found it all. And on one side, on a side of my house, I had another 10 foot of soffit gone. So I talked to your folks and I did exactly this. I was up on the ladder after I had the soffits were placed, fixed in those sections that were, that were missing. I went around the entire house with the caulk gun and with the, with the, with the sealant. And I did exactly that. And boy, those soffits are not going anywhere next time. Knock on wood if there's a next time. So I'm your testimonial on that one. <laughs> that is most uh, excellent. You know, many people have heard of tornado safe rooms, but may not understand that they can be afford. People go, oh, my God, I can't afford that. But they can be affordable, and they are the gold standard for life safety during a tornado. What would you like our listeners to know? Well, again, this is one of those things people don't know, that you don't have to die in a tornado. There is something you can do. We don't have to throw up our hands and, and be fearful because there are two different things. They have slightly different names. There's a tornado safe room mm -hmm. and then tornado shelters and that marketplace and the product lines, et cetera, have really come a long way and become highly affordable. You know, like any innovation, remember, <laughs> well, now I'm going to date us yet again, like I did by talking about Hurricane Andrew. But remember, even when calculators first came out when I was a kid, remember how big they oh, were yeah. and how expensive they were? And now you can get a calculator it's on for your $2 phone. and it works just fine. So tornado safe rooms, yep, they came out. Uh, I think the first research project we did on them um, and to raise awareness was in 1999. But they came, they've been around since the 80s and they were expensive at first. You're talking ten to $12,000 etc a concrete block with rebar reinforced and that was really the only method well now there's a full line of different product choices for tornado safety that provide what's called near absolute protection which means that inside that room you have the highest probability of being protected from injury and death and this is for winds that can go up to wow. as high as an ef5 so it's an extreme safety bunker and a small 10 square foot residential shelter can cost as little as $3,000. There are even some that I've seen online. I wouldn't be able to do this because you have to put them underground and then mm -hmm. crawl inside. They're, they're pod like that can even drop down below $3,000. But if that's something you can do and you're comfortable being enclosed in like in a pod sized space, there's a way to survive a tornado, even the most severe. So that's one of the things that if you live in tornado country, and that means tornado alley through Texas, Oklahoma, and yeah. Arkansas, as well as Dixie alley, right? In the South, we, we get plenty of them here where I am in the Florida Panhandle and yeah. in South Georgia and up Alabama. So a safe room could be your penultimate. Um, 2020 was also a record setting year in California and the United States as a whole. More than 10,000 structures were damaged or destroyed in California alone. But we know it's it's not just a California problem. I was out in the, the great Northwest this summer 
And, uh, you know, you couldn't see a quarter mile in front of you in Oregon because of the smoke from the fires they had, not just in California, blow north, but in Oregon as well. So, you know, many people think there is nothing they can do to save their homes from wildfires. The number one do-it-yourself project a homeowner can do to mitigate against wildfire may surprise some people. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, it's all about the great outdoors and the outside, and and you don't have to have any particular skill. You probably just need a rake and some clippers and a shovel and some garbage bags to get rid of the debris. So think of it this way. Fire cannot occur without three elements, right? Air, heat, and fuel. Well, we can't do anything about air. We wouldn't want to, and we can't control heat, but fuel, okay? Fuel is the piece we focus on with wildfire prevention and removing fuel. What's fuel in a wildfire? Dead shrubs, dead limbs, what we call ladder fuel from shrubs up to treetops and all of those different things that ignite and carry the fire and allow it to continue. So what we want you to do is to create a defensible space around your home where the fuel is either interrupted or broken by the different things you can do to either through irrigation. And there's different, the um, used to advocate for defensible space just in general, but the research community and the fire safety community has even taken it a step further where now there's three different zones in your defensible space that you can create with, with very focused activity. So zone one in your defensible space is closest to your home. Okay, so you go out 30 feet and you make sure that you, first of all, you have enough room if the fire department has to come in and bring their equipment so that they can bring in the hoses and the water supply to put the fire out. And inside that zone, you want to get rid of anything combustible that you can. You can choose different varieties of plants. Sometimes natives are better. Sometimes they're not. You need to talk to your local folks and find out what the the highest water content plants are if you're going to landscape around your house and use those because they're the least prone to ignite and catch fire. So you want to clean all that up, have space for the defenders to come in if they need to, and also have irrigation. Sometimes people just get rid of the shrubs sure. altogether and replace it with rock gardens. You see a lot of people going with, you know, Zare escape and stuff like that. So zone two on defensible space is 30 to 100 feet out. Not all of us have that much space around our houses, which is why it's so great that it's zoned now. And again, you want to use lower flammability plants that are lower to the ground. When we say ladder fuel, we don't want it to catch fire and move, you know, the fire up the ladder. And creating um, fuel breaks, think of your driveway as a break, gravel walkways, you know, prune your trees, keep them six to 10 feet from the ground and just make sure that you've got a handle on how you can interrupt that fuel load to the fire. So three is wider, 100 to 200 feet out. And that's where you want to just remove underbrush and thin vegetation, keeping a special eye on Things like dead, you know, it's a cleanup thing. It's yard work, but this yard work is work that saves your lives. And if if you have a fireplace that's wood burning, don't store your firewood except in zone three or beyond because you don't want that to be fuel that creates a way uh, for the fire to continue. Make sure you clean out your gutters. (laughs) Absolutely. And keeping your gutters clean, you get a twofer out of that because keeping the gutters clean, and there's a lot of nifty, inexpensive tools for gutter cleaning now that there's some great, one of our partners is Lowe's. I love their videos on how to clean your gutters and the new tools that make it easier and a lot safer to do it. But Mm -hmm. for high rain events and for flooding events, you need those gutters too to move water away from your foundation. So you get a twofer for wildfire and flood. Of course I do. Right, Leslie? Uh, <laughs> I'm not answering. I that. hope you have on gloves at <laughs> the, least. The North, the Northeast just experienced one of the biggest <laughs> blizzards we have seen in years. What can you share with the listeners out there that will save them money this winter? So this one is, um, we kind of came up with this years ago because it, it covers all the bases. We want you to foam, hmm? dome, and drip. Go to your big box store and buy some insulation. It's a dollar. 
for six feet of that um, styrofoam insulation. It's already got the slice in it and use it to foam over your exposed pipes around your house because then you can keep them from freezing because as we know, once they freeze, they expand. And once that happens, you're on your way to a break. So that's the foam. Dome is buy some of the little mm -hmm. housing covers. So they've got a little hook inside, right? So you take them and it looks like a miniature styrofoam cooler, right? It's just a little dome that you put over the faucets and you use the hook on it. You hook it around the faucet, you place it over and you just twist the wing nut and it keeps those nice and warm too because that's another right. place where they can freeze. And last but not least, go and put a very tiny drip on your faucets to keep water moving through those pipes because moving water is not going to freeze as readily as water that's sitting still and expanding. And so if you foam dome and drip, you can save yourself a very expensive and potentially dangerous well, and that doesn't cost of much frozen at all. and that's burst terrific. pipes inside You've your given house. us some great tips there uh, on all these perils. Is there anything else that consumers should know? Sure. So tip number eight is really critical, and this applies to any kind of different peril you face, and that's to have a, a ready home inventory. An, in an ordinary house fire, what are you going right. to do after the fire? You're going to file an insurance claim. What do you need to do that? You need a list of all your belongings. You don't have to do anything fancy to do this. Take your, your phone, put it on video, walk through your house, get close-ups of serial numbers on all of your electronics, Talk about when you got them, what's the brand. You can either do still photography or you can do it on video. And then you could just cover all the bases with one little file, put it up on the cloud so that it's easily accessible. You may never need it, but it's a great thing to do in January, especially after the holidays, because a lot of us get gifts that are, you know, maybe a new camera different things that are mm -hmm. covered by your insurance if you have the documentation <laughs> and can file your claim. So create a home inventory, store it on the cloud, and make sure that you keep it current. That's a really nice, important one. And that's something that we just tell people, put it on your calendar and make sure you do it every six months or once a year and um, stay there. So once you've done your inventory, this is tip nine, you might get a question that you're thinking of. I wonder if I have enough insurance. If right. you say you have, I lived in the Middle East, for example. And so we used to go down to the merchant row and look at and bargain for beautiful carpets. Well, fast forward many years later, some of those carpets are worth significant amount of money that Correct, would not sir. necessarily be covered by the limits of my policy right? So as you do your inventory, look for those things and, and make sure you don't need a special rider on your policy for something like a carpet. Maybe it's a piece of art. Maybe it's a jewelry item. And the way you find out if you have what you need is by having a checkup. Call your company or your agent and say, I want to go over my deductibles. I want to go over my coverage limits. Hey, I got this new thing or hey, I sold that thing or I handed something down to my child and make sure your policy lines up behind your belongings. Again, reducing and eliminating any kind of hassle post event, because if you've been through a disaster of a, a house fire or some kind of mega wildfire or any other disaster, it's already been traumatic enough and you don't need anything else to worry about and having a smooth streamlined claims process is entirely possible, but do your part now so that you have that information ready to go. Your company wants you to have that and they want to be able to make you. Yeah. Whole. You know, it's, it's, it's um, funny you you're talking about policies. So One thing I do every year is I have every, all of my current policies, no matter what they are. And I keep hard copies of them in a folder. And uh, if, and when I have to evacuate for a storm, I have all those hard copies. I just take them with me to make sure I have them handy. Just God forbid, in case. So, you know, it's just something that I've always done and I continue to do. Yep, your know, building codes. How That's does excellent. consumer that is find excellent. out more about the building codes in their community? So topping off our top 10 list, we want people to figure out what building code was used to build their home, kind of the recipe, so to speak, for the construction of their home. And we're doing a lot of work in this arena because we did a research project in 2017, a national project. We talked to people in focus groups, and then we did a lot of 
what they call quantitative research to validate. And it, what happened is we proved what we suspected all along, which is number one, people don't understand what a building code is and how important it is to how your house performs in any given disaster. They couldn't tell the difference between a building code and, say, a historic preservation rule or zoning, which is the use of the land, right, and the planning rules. So we want people to know their code because the other thing we we proved in the research is that they're not worried about building codes because they're absolutely certain that they don't need to worry because it's being, quote, handled. People are unfortunately very highly confident the building code is not a concern because they can't fathom that anyone would be allowed to build them a home without the ideal set of construction standards. And unfortunately, that is not necessarily the case. In the U.S., our building code system, and we have been working very um, diligently with FEMA and other partners, especially during the last three years, to analyze and research and, and document this. But only a third of the United States, the communities, the jurisdictions, cities, towns, and the like, have the building codes they need for the specific disasters where they live, which means two thirds of the United mm. States is without the protection of minimum standards that directly address tornado, hurricane, flood, earthquake, wildfire, et cetera. So what we want consumers to do is start by finding out what they have in terms of their home, because there are some ways to retrofit. And the great news is through our work, we've created a transparency tool that they can look up their code. So we have a website called inspectorprotect.org and it's backed by, and everything we do, John, as you know, sure, is backed by us right. and our ability to, to field those specific questions. We want them to check and see, okay, go look at what your code is. When they do that, they're going to get a very <laughs> nice, simple readout. It's going to be red, <laughs> yellow, green, or black. And if it's black, it's because we don't have the data. And that's going to be one of our challenges in the years forward is to get all that building code data in because it doesn't exist in any kind of organized way, but we're slowly gathering it. I bet you Mm -hmm. can guess that red means there isn't a code where you live. And that's very common, especially unfortunately in places they just don't have the resources often to adopt and administer building codes, or it's maybe very rural and they just have other priorities. Yellow means you have a building code in your community that's used, but it's out of date. They're not keeping up with what we call current model codes, which is kind of like not updating your phone. And as we know, if you don't download those updates, what happens to your phone? Crash, right? It stops working. Green means you have a current code that's being used in your community. And hopefully whenever your home was built, it was being used as well. So you've got to really get, you know, we want consumers, as we said at the top, we want them to take charge of their own disaster outcomes. And you do that by being informed and that building code, building codes are minimum. So if you don't have a building code, you're not even in the first floor, right? You're below the minimum and it's below standards. And we really want them to know about that. And once they get there, we can help them with the information about the kinds of things they can do, like strengthening a soffit cover, or maybe you need to get some hurricane shutters, or maybe if you live in a seismic zone, there's some plywood you can put in the basement Mm -hmm. that can be well attached, and that's called bracing your cripple walls. And that'll keep your house from shaking you know, off its foundation. So, so there what are ways is the to essential it, message or challenges for the future that you want to leave with our listeners today? Mm-hmm. I think the most important message I want people to know is you're not in this alone. You know, we're here for them. We're nonprofit. Our information is is highly researched, but it's also free. And our counsel is free. So if you call us with your question and we can't answer it, the, the other thing I want them to know is our partners are the best in the business. We are backed by and supported through partnership with the National Weather Service, FEMA, the insurance industry, specifically State Farm and USAA, leading product manufacturers like Simpson Strong Tie that make the majority of those metal connectors that keep your roof attached to the walls, et cetera. And all these different companies and groups and industries like the, the cement and concrete industry 
They want resilience for you. And we know how to provide it. So I, that's my message is don't go it alone and don't be frustrated. We can help you figure out what you need to do. And um, there's more and more programs out there that provide grants to people to retrofit. And uh, <laughs> leaders are coming forward to close that gap for that two-thirds of the country that really needs to do it differently. And um, I think the future is bright. When it comes to disaster resilience, we've seen tremendous progress over the last 22 years. And I think that it's accelerating. Yeah. So back to when I met you, John, and we were standing around in the mud from Hurricane Andrew, looking at all those decimated homes. It doesn't have to be that way anymore. We know what yeah, to do. Yeah, and the tre- tremendous and amount of progress really ready has made, group of people been made out there since that are, then that help. in disaster safety, you know, certainly thanks to you and Flash and your partners and uh and again, I'm a testimonial. My soffits are a testimony to how Flash can help. I wouldn't have known how to fix that if uh, I hadn't gotten back in touch with you guys and said, hey, what do I need to do to strengthen these soffits so it doesn't happen again? So I am eternally grateful. So Leslie, thank you again. And thank uh, you all for listening to this week's episode of Strong Homes, Safe Families. You can email us at info at flash.org or call us toll free at 877-221-SAFE. That's 877-221-SAFE or 7233. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, share, and provide a review on iTunes. Until next time, for Leslie, for the entire Flash team, I'm John Zarella. Have a happy new year.